Welcome everyone. Know that a team of people has prayed for you. We prayed that the Lord would have joined whoever he wanted to be here. Whether you already know Jesus Christ and are seeking to continue to learn more about him and what the Bible says, or whether you don't yet know Jesus Christ, we are grateful that you're here. I'm going to teach on the actuality of hell and the reality of rescue. This is a critically important topic because actually it isn't spoken of so much anymore. Uh, Jesus spoke more about hell than he did of heaven. He wants people to be warned concerning this reality. And so that is what we are going to seek to do this evening. I want to talk about giving. I have to talk about giving. I can't neglect that. I want you to know that there are tough economic times right now. And, and while Hope and Passion sees some people increasing their giving, and we have a few new givers, there's also... Uh, some givers who have fallen off. It amazes me. People on fixed incomes, people who are not having a lot of extra money, but are still tithing and giving what the Lord wants them to do. And then I am sure there are plenty of people who watch regularly and are not tithing, are not giving 10% to the Lord's work. And we just want to pray and believe that God will continue to provide for us as he faithfully has, as he's doing right now, but I want you to think about that. And I want you to understand something. When you give to hope and passion, first of all, you should be giving because you're being fed. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, God said. And the storehouse is the place where the spiritual food is. So if you're being fed, you should be giving. And you should be giving commensurate with how you're being fed. Not little pittances of giving if this is your main source of learning. But beyond that, I want you to know that Hope and Passion Ministries, we're also a missionary organization. We are on all social media platforms and we are hearing from people every day. People who don't know Jesus. People who will only look at social media. They might never walk into a church building. And you're not only giving because you're being fed, but you're giving to help others find Christ. Now you can give to us on Venmo, looking for us on the Venmo app, that's an easy way to give. You can give on the website. I want to give you an example of what you're investing in. Two things really happened today. One thing was I advertised this hell event on Facebook. And what happened on the Hope and Passion part of Facebook was a young man, I believe it's a young man, reached out after my posting about this hell message. And he said something like, I'm on the highway to hell. And he had little musical notes beside it. Now, usually if I see a post like that, I don't have time to respond to all of them. Sometimes I ignore them. Sometimes if posts are offensive, I delete them. But in this case, the Holy Spirit prompted my heart to respond. And so I responded to this man and I said, well, you don't have to be. You could be on the road to heaven. Jesus loves you. Then this man responded back to me and he said something that I'm not sure if he was trying to be a smart aleck about it or if he was genuinely asking the question, although I don't doubt he was asking the question from his heart, because statistics prove that there are many, many people, even in America today, who have actually never heard of Jesus. Maybe in some passing comment, but they have no idea who he is. So then this man said to me, well, who is Jesus? And I proceeded then later in the afternoon to make a TikTok regarding who is Jesus, for beginners and I got comments on the TikTok. Several people thanked me for presenting the reality of Jesus in a way that they could understand. I talked about his divinity, his humanity, who he is. I actually explained the Trinity on that video. These are the doors that open for us. These are the type of people that we're reaching and your giving makes that possible. So many people who here aren't giving but the people who can give and who know in their hearts it's right to do should give. Another thing I want to share with you today, we were messaged in hope and passion on our Facebook page by someone who serves in the army. Uh, I don't know the age of this man. Uh, I want to think he's maybe a little bit younger, but he serves in the military and he reached out and he said he's struggling with negative thoughts, struggling with intrusive thoughts. He's looking for spiritual input. I was able to connect him to a message that I did about that very issue on YouTube. We had a little bit of back and forth and finally, here's what this young man said. He said, awesome. 
You're a great teacher, and I think Jesus puts your reels, that's R-E-E-L-S, but put your videos on my Facebook timeline. So I think my discernment may be correct that he's giving me a message that I'm supposed to watch and learn what you're teaching. How about that? So giving makes all this possible. We are not only feeding the sheep, we're a missionary organization that is reaching those who don't yet know Christ. So please, please pray about giving. This is something that I don't often do, which is more of a topical message. However, we are going to go directly through a passage in Revelation chapter 20 as we study health. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to humble your heart before the Lord. Whether you know Jesus or you don't, whether you're sure that you're going to heaven or you're not, I'm asking you to humble your heart before God and to let him touch you. You know, God can't do anything if you're resisting him. But if you're willing, if you want to say, God, is there something you want to show me? If you're real and there's something you want to show me, show me. If you'll humble your heart, he will. And for those of us who already know Christ, how many of you would admit we need to know more of an understanding of both heaven and hell? Right? We need to be equipped to speak about it. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time together in your word. I thank you for every eternal soul who is gathered here tonight, who will watch it on YouTube. We ask in the mighty name of Jesus that you would literally whisk people off the highway to hell and put them on the road to heaven by the saving blood and life of Jesus Christ. I pray that this message would hit home, that it would hit hard for those who are not properly understanding what happens to a person who rejects Jesus after they die. Lord, I want to tell people the truth. I know that you've made me responsible to tell the truth. I know, God, that I will answer to you. And so I ask you to bless me in this this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here we go. The actuality of hell and the reality of rescue. Matthew Henry, that old English commentator, here's what he said. He said, the Lord help us firmly to believe this doctrine of the judgment to come. And his prayer was hundreds of years ago. But I want to tell you, we should be praying the same thing. There are myriad people who do not believe in hell. And some of those people are the people who are sitting in pews in churches, who have given in to the heresy of universalism, that everyone is automatically saved, that everyone goes to heaven. This is a lie from hell itself. It's a lie from the enemy. We must believe this core doctrine of the Bible. This is one of those doctrines that we cannot agree to disagree on. It's one of those that we have to stand firmly on that there exists an eternal hell. Now, the one thing that you don't want to be is like the gentleman who is spoken of here in Acts 24, 25. And I encourage you to read the whole narrative at some point. But this is actually regarding... Uh, the procurator of Rome, his name is Felix, all right? So he's a governing official in Rome. And he was having some back and forth talk with the apostle Paul, who was imprisoned for the gospel's sake. And he asked for a hearing with Paul, you know, to, to talk about things. And the Bible says, as Paul reasoned with Felix, this Roman ruler, as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control, and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I'll summon you again. You know what the sad facts of the Bible are? We are, he is never, it is never told again that Felix ever came back and wanted to deal with this information any further. So we're left to assume that Felix died and went to hell. Because he put off the decision. And my prayer tonight is that you won't put this off. That you will hear this message from God's word and you will not delay. 
that you will allow the Lord to speak to you and you'll act quickly on his conviction. Uh, J.I. Packer, I like this statement. He said, if we do not preach about sin and God's judgment on it, then we cannot present Christ as a savior from sin and the wrath of God. If we're silent about these things and preach a Christ who saves only from self and the sorrows of this world, we're not preaching the Christ of the Bible. We are in effect bearing false witness and preaching a false Christ. Amen? There is a real hell. There is a real eternal punishment. Jesus came and died and gave his life that we might be saved from sin and all of its consequences in eternity. Think about that. Warren Wearsby, if we once saw sin as God sees it, we would understand why such a place as hell exists. And I want you to think about something. You know, I put a quote out on Facebook before the message because I got to thinking, it's, it's really kind of twisted how everybody wants to believe in heaven and hardly anybody wants to believe in hell. But the fact of the matter, that, that, that's like saying, okay, I'm going to walk through this world. I'm going to live my whole life and I'm going to believe that there's only good in the world and I'm going to deny that there's any evil. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Who can live in the world today and deny that there is evil and perversion and abuse and destruction and hatred? Who can deny it? Listen, one day all good is going to rush to one place. Therefore, all evil is going to rush to another. And so to deny hell is to like, Walk through the world and say, well, I don't even believe in evil. If we could know how bad sin has not only hurt us, sometimes we're afraid to look at how badly sin has harmed us. If we knew the depths of suffering because of sin, we would surely believe in hell. Now, our main text for this is going to be a series of verses from Revelation chapter 20. It's what is called the great white throne judgment. But that the, the judgment itself is not going to be the, the gist of this message. We're going to talk about hell as it relates to God's narrative toward the end of Revelation. So what we read in Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 is, The Apostle John who was given this vision said, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Now, this judgment comes at the end of everything, the end of the tribulation, after the battle of Armageddon, after the millennial reign of Christ. John says, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The first thing I want you to clearly understand and never mistake is the person who is seated on the great white throne judgment at the end of time is Jesus. I want you to understand it is so critical to see how all the work of Jesus ties together. He is the Jesus, first of all, of creation. Chapter 1 of John, chapter 1 of Colossians, chapter 1 of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the active agent in the creation of the universe. He is the Jesus of creation. He is the Jesus of the cross, right? He actually created the universe. And because he's the one that made us, he's the one that came to die for us. In the same way, because he's the one that came to pay the price for us. And because when we reject that, we are really rejecting him. Who better is it of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be the judge than Jesus, right? He is the Jesus of creation, the Jesus of the cross, the Jesus of judgment, and then thank the Lord, if you're saved, you're so grateful that he is also the Jesus of recreation. He's gone to prepare a place for us. He's coming back again to remake the world. But it is Jesus who is actually the judge. And I'm going to give you the scriptural backing for that. <clears throat> Matthew 25, verse 31. 
when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. You see that? It is Jesus who will sit on the throne when he comes again in his glory. When he came the first time, he didn't come in his glory. He withheld his glory and he came to suffer on our behalf. But one day he's coming back with all the angels and he's going to sit on his glorious throne. In John 5, 22 to 23, clearly the Gospel of John says that the Father judges no one. But he's given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And by the way, just a little P.S. here, postscript for y'all, if you say, I believe in God, or I know God, or I'm going to heaven, and yet you do not believe that Jesus is God, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, then no, you don't know the Father. And if you don't honor the Son, you don't honor the Father. You're fooling yourself. The Father actually doesn't judge anyone. He's given judgment to the Son. In John 5, 27, the Father has given Jesus authority to execute judgment. See that? There it is again. He's given him the authority to execute judgment. Why? Because Jesus is not only the Son of God, he's the Son of Man. He's the one who put on skin and bones. He is the God-man. He is divinity. He is humanity. He's the one who came to pay the price, so he will be the judge. Then in verses 28 through 29, Oh, these are some wild words to ponder. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all, not just the saved, not just the unsaved, but everyone who is in the grave, everyone who is in the tomb, everyone who is in the urn, everyone whose ashes are scattered in the ocean, everyone will hear his voice and come out of their grave. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I have a separate message on the YouTube channel called The Coming Hour. And the reality is that everybody is going to get their body back. Now this is critical when we're talking about hell. It's not just the saved that get a glorified brand new body to live forever in heaven. You would need to have an immortal body to endure the glory of heaven. But it is also the unsaved who get their bodies back. They are physically resurrected to go to hell. So to answer the question right off the bat, is hell just spiritual? Is it mental? Is it just a feeling of guilt? Is it physical? Is it emotional? My answer is yes, 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 yes. You will suffer in your body as well as every other way. Psalm chapter 2, verse 12. Kiss the sun. That's the son of God, Jesus, lest he be angry and you perish in the way because his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. We think we're getting away with it in this life. We say, oh, well, this Jesus who supposedly came 2,000 years ago, he hasn't come back yet. I don't believe I'm going to have to face him. Better, better be careful because his wrath can whip up in an instant just because he was the Jesus who suffered for us he is also at the same time the Jesus who is coming to judge. So everyone needs to be forewarned on that. Ezekiel 33, 11, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die? God is saying that to somebody right now. He wants somebody to hear this. God, although he will, you, you will be in hell. You will face God's eternal judgment if you reject Christ and give in to evil by rejecting him. He does not take pleasure in that. He's telling you, turn back, turn back, turn back. Now, Jesus steps up to his throne and then the very next verse in Revelation 20 says, And from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. This is incredible. I can't even imagine. As you are waiting to be judged by God, and you kind of look up ahead, you know, and you're like, I'm waiting to be judged by God, but the earth just took off. The sky just took off. 
Jupiter just ran, you know? The earth and all the heavens just took off at the sight of Jesus on this throne. The awesomeness of this judgment is incredible. And what is meant here by no place was found for them. See, earth and sky will have to run because earth and sky is still cursed by sin and will be up until this point. And even the sin-cursed earth cannot withhold, uh, it cannot stand in the presence of holy Jesus and his glory without being remade and recreated. That's why we believers will get brand new glorified bodies while the earth has to be made, to, made new also. And so this is a reference to what we learn of in 2 Peter chapter 3, which is a chapter I recommend you all read, 2 Peter 3. The Bible says, by the same word that created the earth originally, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. You see that? This old earth is one day going to be destroyed by fire and remade. And that will be a day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. These are ominous, ominous words. And so Peter goes on to say, since all things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be? And, and this is written to Christians. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? While you're waiting for and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens are will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. That, that image, I've never thought of that before, but that image on this day of judgment, the heavens are going to be set on fire and just dissolve. Heavenly bodies will melt. I mean, I'm picturing Saturn with its rings up there, you know, just melting. This is unbelievable, but it's in the Bible. You can say, Shelly, it seems fantastical. Yeah, well, our God is supernatural. He is infinitely higher than we are, and it's about time we start listening to what he says because by listening to what humanity has said for as long as we have has gotten us into quite the mess. We need to realize the truth of God's word. But the Bible promises that according to his promise... We are waiting for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, where everything is as God wants it to be. There's a new heavens and a new earth coming. That's, that's on the flip side of this coin when we're speaking about hell. Now, verse 12. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. If you want more details about the great white throne judgment itself, I have a message on that. I believe it's within the Revelation series and maybe also a separate message, but suffice it to say, I want you to understand something here. When the Bible says, I saw the dead, that doesn't mean the physically dead. The context here makes it clear that these are the spiritually dead. I saw the spiritually dead. Now to be spiritually dead, let me break this down. If right now, wherever you are watching this, if you can say honestly from your heart, I have trusted in Jesus as my savior from sin and his spirit now lives in me. Guess what? You are spiritually alive. If you cannot say that you have trusted in Jesus as your savior from sin, and therefore his spirit does not live inside of you, you are spiritually dead. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. The first time we're born physically, we're born spiritually dead. We have to be born twice. We have to be born spiritually in order to have spiritual life. The spiritually dead, great and small, includes everybody. The rich, the famous, the poor, the unknown, the healthy, the sick, whoever it might be. All the spiritually dead, great and small, stood before that throne of Jesus, his judgment throne. His great white throne judgment is for the unsaved. And the word of God says the books were opened. 
Then there was another book which was open, which is the book of life. So there's a stack of books on one side, and on the other hand, there's one book, which is the book of life. And the Bible says the dead, the spiritually dead, those without Jesus, those who have rejected him, they were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. So they are judged based on what they did in their life and the fact that they didn't have Jesus. So every sin is going to be brought up. I want to remind you that Jesus tells us in Luke 12, 47 and 48, that there is a group of people who may even pretend to be Christian, who may be religious, who may have gone to church. But there's a group of people, as you read this whole parable in context, that say they're serving their master. But because their master, who we know is Jesus, stayed away for quite some time, they assumed he wasn't ever coming back, or at least he was going to be greatly delayed. And Jesus said of that type of person that that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready, didn't act according to his master's will, that person will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. Now what this scripture is telling us is there are degrees of punishment in hell. The more you know, the more you will be responsible for. I believe the number of times that you genuinely reject a true message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the more you will suffer in hell for rejecting it. Whereas people with very little information, while they still have rejected Christ, will suffer to a lesser degree somehow. How that all plays out, it's, it's like asking me, uh, people ask me all the time, we know for sure that there are levels of rewards in heaven, you know, and you can lose reward at the judgment seat of Christ. And people always ask me, what does that mean? Like, what are the rewards? Well, we're not told exactly, but the Bible does make clear that there are levels of rewards in heaven, levels of punishment in hell. As a matter of fact, Jesus said straight out, this is no parable. He says straight out, Matthew 11, 23 and 24. He's speaking of Capernaum, which was his earthly headquarters. When Jesus first started his ministry, when he came 2,000 years ago, Capernaum was headquarters. Here's what he said. You, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? In other words, just because Jesus was there doing mighty works, does that mean you're going to be in heaven? He says, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, everybody know what Sodom's famous for, being destroyed with fire and brimstone for such excessive perversion and sinfulness, right? Jesus said, my headquarter city, you're going to be brought down to Hades. Why? Because if all the mighty works that I did in Capernaum had been done in Sodom, Sodom would still be here to this day. But I tell you that it's going to be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Whoa! Jesus said it'll be more tolerable for Sodom, of Sodom and Gomorrah. It'll be more tolerable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for his headquarters of his ministry. Why is that? Because Capernaum, the people of Capernaum, had Jesus in the flesh right in front of them. They had him preaching and testifying and doing miracles and others testifying to what he had done, to who he was, and they still rejected him. Sodom didn't have quite as much light. And so Jesus is telling us that the punishment will be different. So listen, you are responsible for what you know. You are responsible for how much God has shown you of himself and his son. Next scripture, the great white throne judgment. And then the sea gave up the dead who were in it. 
Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. The sea, you know, represents this vast, mysterious place where, of course, in biblical days, so many people died at sea and they were never found again. But all, this is basically God saying all of the dead were vomited up. Death has to do with the physical body upon death. Hades has to do with the spiritual self, what happens upon death. And he says the physical bodies and the spirits from Hades all get vomited up from where they are. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Every spiritually dead person is resurrected, and they get judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the, what does it say here? Death and Hades, the grave... And the place where your spirit goes before the great white throne judgment, when you're unsaved, are thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. When we use the word hell, what, what most people who have true knowledge of the Bible mean when they say hell is not Hades. That, that's something a little bit different. Hell is the eternal lake of fire, the second death, the final judgment. I'm going to explain that a little bit more. I'm going to use this chart to help you understand. The first death. Your first death, if you're unsaved, is when you physically die. Okay, so at your first death, as an unsaved person, someone who's rejected Jesus your earthly life will end. Biologically, your body is dead. At that point, your soul will go to torment in Hades. I don't have time tonight, but Jesus spoke of this in Luke chapter 16. Hades is a place where the spirit or the soul of an unsaved person goes until the time of the great white throne judgment. And it is a place of torment terrible torment a knowledge suddenly that all hope is gone for you to call upon the lord for anything good if you think this world is bad if you think this world is rough you're still experiencing some of the grace of god just by existing in this world when you're removed from this world and your soul goes to hades it's over place of torment no hope and your body goes to the grave. Okay, so there's a temporary separation of the body from the soul. Just like there is for saved people. When a saved person dies, their body goes to the grave. But their spirit or their soul goes into the presence of the Lord. And all the saved people who are in the presence of the Lord right now, whose souls are with him, one day they are going to get to go to a final heaven, which is called the new heavens and new earth. But the unsaved, all the people who rejected Jesus who have already died, they're not in the final hell, but they are in torment. Now, at the second death, which is what we're speaking of in Revelation 20, the eternal lake of fire after the judgment, the great white throne judgment, that's when permanent damnation is finalized. It's kind of like I've likened it to this, you know, uh, if a person is accused of committing a very serious crime, they are put in jail, if there's enough evidence, right? They're put in jail. Even though their trial hasn't happened yet, they're considered a danger, and they are put in jail. And it is in jail that they await their trial, their final sentencing. You can think of it that way. There's no such thing as soul sleep. I could give you lots of evidence for that too if I had the time. No such thing as soul sleep. The minute anyone dies, the minute a human being dies, you can look at their body there on the bed or you know, wherever they've died at, the scene of the accident. But I want to tell you something. They're not there anymore. Their spirit or their soul is immediately either in the presence of the Lord or in this place called Hades. Second death is when permanent damnation is finalized, this final sentencing phase. 
the body will be resurrected and reunited with the soul for eternal punishment in hell, which is, hell is really, the definition of hell is the lake of fire. Okay, Hades, I think we've defined for you at this point, temporary. One day death and Hades itself all get thrown into hell. Hell is the lake of fire. That's the difference between your first death and your second death. How many of you would like to be born again, right? And go from death to life rather than death to death. I'm so grateful that only because of Jesus, not because of Shelly Brindle, I'm a wretch. Only because of Jesus, I only, I'm only going to go through one death, <laughs> earthly death. And then it's right into life. Hallelujah. Now, let's get down to the nitty gritty about hell. Some of the questions you often think about. I want to talk to you about the Greek word behind what Jesus said when he talks about hell in the New Testament. I've already said to you that Jesus spoke more of hell than heaven. So it's very serious to him. He wants everybody to understand it. Now, when we read our Bible, what is translated as hell in many places is the Greek word Gehenna. So I want you to understand this word because after I explain this word to you, then I'm going to show you places where Jesus used the word Gehenna. It's written in your Bible as hell, but I want you to have a new understanding of just how bad that place is that Jesus is speaking of. So Gehenna is the New Testament root for the word hell. And it comes from a Hebrew word, the Old Testament. And the Hebrew word is Gehinnom, or what is known as the Valley of Hinnom. It was an actual place in the Old Testament that was referred to as the Valley of Hinnom. Now, to know how bad this place is, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to open them up. If you don't, I'm going to read it for you. But Jeremiah chapter 19 shows us the horror of the actual earthly location. This is the earthly location. The Valley of Hinnom. Jeremiah 19 verses 1 to 9. Now what I put on the PowerPoint here for you to understand, again, this is all connected to the Greek word Gehenna that Jesus uses when he speaks of hell. It's from the Hebrew Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom became a place of child sacrifice to foreign gods. And let me tell you something. It wasn't it was Israel, it was God's chosen people that were taking their children and sacrificing them to foreign gods. That's how hideous this location is and what it's known for. Listen to Jeremiah 19, 1 to 9. Thus says the Lord, go buy a potter's earthenware flask and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priests. And go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom at the entry of the potsherd gate and proclaim there the words that I tell you. And I hope you're not eating right now when you're trying to watch this because listen. Jeremiah, you shall say, hear the word of the Lord. O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I am bringing such disaster upon this place. What place? The Valley of Hinnom. I am bringing such disaster upon this place that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. When you've ever heard about hell or read about it in the Bible, have your ears ever tingled? Have you ever like got a reaction in your body to the horror of it? This is what God said. Now listen. Because the people have forsaken me. And that's why you end up in hell, by the way. Because you forsake God. Because the people have forsaken me and have profaned this place by making offerings in it to other gods 
whom neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known. So because they're committing idolatry, idolatry and have forsaken the true God, and because they filled this place with the blood of innocence, innocent children, and have built the high places of Baal to, listen, this is what, this is what the Jews did, to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal. God said, because you've done all this, which I did not command or decree, nor did it ever come into my mind for you to do such a thing. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place, the valley of Himon, shall no more be called Topeth or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but it will now be called the valley of slaughter. And in this place, I will make void the plans of Judah and Jerusalem and I will cause their people to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hand of those who seek their life. I will give their dead bodies for food to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the earth. And I will make this city a horror, a thing to be hissed at. Everyone who passes by it will be horrified and will hiss because of all its wounds. And I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and their daughters. And everyone shall eat the flesh of his neighbor in the siege and in the distress with which their enemies and those who seek their life afflict them. Yes, that's what the Bible says. And history bears it out. That this location, the Valley of Hinnom, there in Jerusalem. When Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem in 586 BC and when the Romans besieged and destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, in both accounts, we have biblical testimony and outside historical source testimony that Jews, as Jerusalem was besieged so horribly and they were starving to death, they ate one another, including their children. They killed and boiled their own children. I'll tell you what. What a place for Jesus to use as the root word for hell. You know what hell ultimately is? It's you getting all the horror of sin that you loved in life, you can have it forever to an nth degree. I want you to understand that. I'm not mincing words here. I'm a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have to tell you all the truth and I'm telling you the truth. This location after Old Testament days, it was used later by the Jews. When you're, when you're moving into the New Testament, it was used later by the Jews for dumping refuge and dead bodies of animals and executed criminals. It was a dump. And because animals and bodies of criminals were going into that place, it had continuing fires so that the contents were always consumed. Can you see now why Jesus would think that was an apt image? Something earthly that we could that doesn't even touch the beginnings of the horrors of hell, but something earthly that Jesus could give to us to make us know how horrible this place is. Constant fire to consume the contents and the roots of this horrible, horrible place. Between the Old and New Testaments, 
It was used to describe the hell of fire. And when we read the following scriptures about what Jesus described hell as, that is the word behind hell in these scriptures. So let's look at just a few. Matthew 18, 8 and 9. Jesus said, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. Notice that wording there kind of matches Revelation 20, the eternal lake of fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the Gehenna of fire. Think about that. It is crazy scripture. Seems so crazy. It's really not. I mean, listen to what Jesus said. We know that he didn't literally mean hands and eyes, but he meant do whatever it takes to cut sin out of your life and make whatever sacrifice you need to make to cut sin out of your life and to turn to Jesus Christ. Because look, I got that backwards. You should turn to Christ first and then you'll be able to cut out the sin. But here's what he said. The phrasing here is incredible. It's better for you to enter life. Now he's not talking about being born. People are obviously already born. They're, they're already in sin. What he means is to enter life is it's better for you to make a decision to enter eternal life wherever you are. If you're five years old, if you're 105 years old, or anywhere along the continuum, it's better for you to enter eternal life, to make a decision to trust in Christ it's better for you to enter life crippled or lame. It's better for you to enter eternal life, even while you're here on earth, give up whatever you have to give up, leave behind whatever sin you have to leave behind. However bad it hurts, it's better for you to do without that sin and enter into eternal life than soon at your death to go with everything you enjoyed in life, all of your sins, all of your faculties, to just live it up, eat, drink, and be merry, but then when you die, to be thrown into eternal Gehenna. Does that make sense now? This actually isn't a very crazy statement. Jesus is speaking truth here. He says, it's better for you to turn to me no matter what that means, no matter what you're giving up, than to be thrown into the Gehenna of fire. Jesus said it'd be better to lose a hand or an eyeball. We got people here who can't even give up a habit. Can't even say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you to get rid of this addiction. We got people who can't even give up selfishness. Pornography. Chasing careers and money. Jesus said if you have to cut off body parts. He didn't mean it literally. But you get why he said this. He's using hyperbole. He's overthrowing it. Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body. But cannot kill the soul. Jesus was here speaking to his disciples. He was going to be leaving them soon. They were going to go out and be, be persecuted, and many of them die for his name. And what he said to them was, I don't want you to fear the people who are going to kill your body, but they can't kill your soul. He said, but I do want you to fear him who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna, hell, the eternal lake of fire. Imagine, Jesus puts it in perspective. He's like, fearing physical death is nothing fearing suffering persecution is nothing compared to fearing god who can take body and soul and put both in hell right the devil through human beings can persecute, can kill, but can't destroy the soul. But God, 
and take the soul to eternal punishment. Jesus also said in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Did you read that statement? You think, oh, well, hell is for, hell is for murderers. Hell is for people who've just lived heinously evil lives. Um, have you ever been angry? Have you ever called somebody an idiot with real anger in your heart? Have you ever hated someone? Because Jesus said, if you say, if you're angry enough at somebody to call them a fool, an idiot, moron, whatever it is, could be worse, right? Whoever says that will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, Jesus isn't speaking. If you've trusted in Jesus as your Savior, all your sin was put on him on the cross 2,000 years ago. And you won't want to live like that anymore, even though you fail sometimes. But if you have never put your sin on Jesus, if you've never trusted in him, if he's not living in you, I want you to know something. Just calling somebody a fool is enough to send you to hell. Everyone has sin. Everyone is liable to the hell of fire, Gehenna. Matthew 23, 15, Jesus was speaking to religious people. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. You try to get people to join you in your religiousness. And when they start to follow you, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. This is critical because Jesus was speaking to the people who copied the Bible and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. He called them hypocrites. And he said that hypocrites are people who are children of Gehenna, children of hell children of the eternal lake of fire now i don't know there's one uh one type of child that i don't want to be called and that's a child of hell you can be a child of god through jesus christ or you're a child of hell but if you're a hypocrite so listen hell isn't just for the blatantly evil and those who outright reject god and mince no words about it hell is for church attending people Church attending people, Bible carrying people, hell is for Sunday school teachers, anybody in those categories that truly hasn't from the humility of their own heart trusted in Jesus. The self-righteous go to hell. Right? I want you to see this. A couple other things before we close. In addition to fire, which I already talked about, is the suffering emotional, spiritual, physical. It's all those. In addition to actually having your body and understanding where you're at and what's going on, in addition to all that and the fire, the Bible talks about total darkness. Hell is also a place of total darkness. I know it seems odd because how can it have fire and darkness? We, listen, what I try to say to people is God speaks in terms that we're able to comprehend to tell us how glorious heaven is. He uses imagery like streets of gold, you know, and, and, and the uh, rainbow surrounding the throne and the angels. I mean, there's all kinds of imagery that God uses in ways that we can comprehend to tell us about heaven. But how many of you think we even have a minuscule grasp of what heaven's really like? <laughs> Not... I mean, it's infinitely greater. So is hell, infinitely worse. God's just using terms that we can kind of wrap our minds around. And here's what Jesus said. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Outer darkness. To be in darkness forever. 
How many of you have ever had a rough night? A night when you're like stirring over your own guilt or sin, worrying about problems in the world, you've been up all night sick, and like it's 3 a.m. in the morning, and you're like, will the night ever end? And the only thing you're waiting for is the sunrise, that first glimmer of sun coming through. The, you know what I'm talking about? Imagine you'd never see light again. Total darkness and suffering. Weeping and gnash, gnashing of teeth. You get that image? Regret. Oh, anger. Seething anger. Still rejecting the God of the Bible. Weeping. Gnashing of teeth. Darkness forever. 2 Peter 2.17, speaking of false prophets, because there are many preachers and pastors that will be in hell. If they're false, these are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. The thought just struck me. If you're a pastor, if you're a preacher, if you're a ministry leader and you never talk about hell, I don't know. Are you in danger of going there? Because are you a false prophet? Are you only telling people one side of the story? I don't mean to call it story either because it's truth. You gotta tell all the truth. The worm devouring the wicked never dies. Now this goes back to that whole thing about the Valley of Hinnom and we know that this became a place where animal carcasses and dead bodies were put and there was a fire constantly going to consume those things. But of course, when you have flesh, rotting flesh in a place, you're going to have worms. You're going to have uh, living organisms, right? And Jesus actually said in Mark chapter 9, verse 48, that hell is a place where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Hey, this goes on forever. The worm never dies. The fire is not quenched. There's a constant eating away. And I can only imagine what that, that gnawing, that eating away, knowing what you've lost forever. Living in the weight of guilt that is unmitigated by any other activity or any other hope or any other distraction. Wow. Wow. In the Old Testament, Isaiah 66, 24, they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me for their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Hell is also described as a place of banishment from God's kingdom. It's not only that you'll be in hell, but you won't be in heaven. Imagine, in Luke 13, 28, Jesus said, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves will be cast out. Can you imagine? At the great white throne judgment, somehow it appears that the damned will be given a brief look at what they could have been in or should have been in because Jesus died for them, but they rejected that way and now they go to hell. Cast out from all of the fellowship and glory and love that will be in the kingdom of heaven. And as we've read in these verses, and just want to reiterate this, you will forever be weeping and gnashing your teeth at the loss, at the guilt, at the eternal shame. You know what it feels like when you're ashamed of something and you kind of want to put your head down because you're so ashamed you don't want anybody to know? Imagine living in bold face, open shame forever. Cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And finally, it is eternal. Some people talk about, oh, going to hell, you know, you go to hell, but then you, you cease to exist. You, you, you're extinguished. Your soul doesn't exist anymore. I want to tell you something, and I want to be unequivocal. I want everybody to understand this. According to the word of God, God created us, and once we are created, we go on from there forever, in one place or another, heaven or hell. This is eternal torment. 
The devil who had deceived them, listen to this, the devil who had deceived the unsaved people was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast, the antichrist, and the false prophet already were, and they will be tormented how long? What does it say? Day and night, forever and ever. Okay? They, the devil, the demons, the antichrist, the false prophets, going to be tormented day and night, forever and ever. But here's the kicker. A few verses later, speaking of the same eternal lake of fire, the Bible says, if anyone's name, okay, this is at the end of the great white throne judgment we've been studying. If anyone's name, man, woman, young adult, teenager, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now we just learned four verses previous that that lake of fire is a place of torment forever and ever. Jesus called it the eternal fire of hell. He said it was a place where the worm never dies. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And this is the last thing that I have to share with you. This book of life must be critically important because if your name isn't in there, you get thrown into the lake of fire. Now, this isn't some like simple act of, oh, you know, I'm going to write my name in this book. Listen, I want to tell you something. The, the book of life belongs to Jesus. I'm going to show you that. Unger's Bible Dictionary concerning all those qualities of hell I just shared with you. It says this. Who shall say that the reality will not infinitely surpass in awfulness the boldest pictures of it? How many of you now believe that God has gone out of his way to make sure in language we can understand that we know we do not want to be in hell? Don't you think he's done a good job at that? We do not want to be there, my friends. You can try to ignore these verses, but they're there. And God is urging you, you don't want to be there. Because of the symbolic nature of the language, some people question whether hell consists of actual fire. Such reasoning should bring no comfort to the lost. The reality is greater than the symbol. The Bible exhausts human language in describing heaven and hell. The former is more glorious and the latter more terrible than language can ever express. I know we do it on Google now, but remember maps that you had to unfold? You unfold a map, you're going to go on a vacation somewhere, and you open this map, and you see lines that represent roads. And then maybe, you know, you and your family were all headed to some beautiful lake. You were going to have a picnic, get in a boat on the lake. And if you look on the map, there's this big blue splotch, and that's supposed to be the lake. Well, that's the symbol for the lake. How many of you think that when you get to the lake, it's a lot more enjoyable than the symbol? In the same way. If you get on your phone, you're going to go somewhere and there's a symbol of flames there. You know, don't go here because there's, there's a big fire, there's fire trucks. I mean, how many of you know that the picture of the flame is not nearly as bad as being in the flame? The reality is greater than the symbol. What as horrifying as the Valley of Hinnom is, as horrifying as hell that Jesus describes to us is, is not even close to the reality. So if anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, I want to end by sharing this. Here's your hope. Book of life. Revelation 21, 27, it's called the Lamb's Book of Life. Lamb with a capital L because that's Jesus. John the Baptist said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came as a lamb to the slaughter came to give his life. And that's interesting. He came as a lamb to the slaughter. And we found out in the Old Testament that the Valley of Hinnom, God said, would be called the Valley of Slaughter, right? Jesus took that for you on the cross. He is the lamb that was slain. It is his book of life that you need to be in. It is the book of life of the lamb who was slain, Revelation 13, 8. Listen. 
I can confidently say the statement made in Philippians 3.20, I can say this about my own life. My citizenship is in heaven. And from it, I await a savior, my Lord Jesus Christ. My citizenship, my name is written, it's enrolled in the annals of heaven, in the book of life. My question for you is, is yours. It is the Lamb's book of life. Is your name written in the book of Jesus? Have you trusted him? John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. You've entered into life right now. In time, you've actually entered into eternal life. The moment you trust in Jesus. But whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God just stays on him. I want you to know right now, in real time and space, wherever you are, if you have rejected Jesus, if you haven't trusted in him, asked him to forgive you, come in and live in your heart, I want you to know something. The wrath of God is already on your head. It just so happens that you're still in this world where God's general grace is working in the world. But his wrath is on you, and you know it. And I want to tell you, when you leave this world, common grace is gone. And you will only experience the wrath of God forever and ever. But look, if you believe in the Son, you'll have eternal life. It's only when you don't believe and obey the Son that the wrath of God remains on you. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 10. Oh, these are rough words. Don't want to have to do a sermon series on this. Listen to this. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Won't be destroyed and they're gone. It's eternal destructing constantly eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed when Jesus returns do you want to be marveling at him because he's your savior do you want to just be totally overtaken at the sight of him because you love him so much or do you want to feel his judgment come upon you? The choice really is yours. God's given you the choice. And he's provided Jesus for you. Matthew Henry, let it be our great concern to see on what terms we stand with our Bibles. Whether this word of God justifies us or condemns us now. For the judge of all will proceed by the rule of this book. Christ shall judge the secrets of all men according to the gospel. Happy are those who have so ordered and stated their cause according to the gospel as to know beforehand that they shall be justified in the great day of the Lord's judgment. It should be our great concern to know where we stand concerning what God has said in this book. And I've shared with you just a smattering of what God has said concerning hell. And God has said this to us, not because he hates us, because he loves us. He's provided a way out of hell. And that provision is a living way. It's not a set of rules. It's not a religion. The way out of hell is Jesus Christ. I want you to pray with me if you need Jesus. And I'm going to ask every believer who has been watching this to pray for the salvation of those who need to pray this prayer. So if you want to trust in Jesus as Savior as your way out of hell, pray with me now. Dear Lord, 
I come before you. My heart believes what you have said. And I want to humble myself and say, I am sorry for my sin. I am sorry for rejecting Jesus. And in this moment, I actively and willingly put my trust in the Lamb of God who took my sin and suffered in my place. God, I ask you now to let his spirit live in me and give me that quiet, beautiful assurance that I'm on the way to heaven, not hell. And I thank you, God Almighty, in Jesus' amazing name, amen.